One of the hardest parts of telling any story is delivering that powerful opening, the hook, as it were, that the audience will sink into and just allow themselves to be yanked and pulled along for a fantastic ride. An opening can be told in so many different ways. It can be told through incredible music, through powerful prose, through great silent acting. The opening can be whatever it is that you need it to be, but it must, it absolutely must communicate character atmosphere and important points of the plot in order to let the audience know what kind of adventure they're about to go on and it gives them a promise of things to expect and if you don't deliver on that you will then lose your audience openings must absolutely stick the landing so therefore they're absolutely one of the hardest things to do and yet Disney Disney was once an absolute just powerhouse of not just great storytelling but of phenomenal openings to their animated movies by golly they are some of the best things you could ever watch and yet today disney could never ever recreate the powerful moments that they once did back during their renaissance and even a little bit after their renaissance and I'm going to prove that in this video. Hi there everyone, Lars here from Camille's Harem. Not just a podcast for novice writers by novice writers, but also a YouTube channel by novice writers for novice writers. Because writing is an adventure, it's more fun with friends. And in this video, what I want to do is I want to do a couple of things. I want to break down some very iconic openings from various Disney films. I want to talk about why they work, and I also want to talk about why Disney will never, ever do them again. And that's one of the reasons, amongst many, why storytelling from Disney these days just unequivocally sucks. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a look at Aladdin, Bocahannes, The Lion King, Atlantis, and The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Now, the movie Aladdin does a couple of interesting things at the opening. You see, you could just simply say that the opening musical theme, where the genie pretending to be a salesman, that that right there is the opening because you get the song of Arabian Nights, and he introduces the story. So, okay, there's your opening. However, what I would argue is that you have a double act happening here in this opening. You have the genie coming on in, introducing the story, but then telling you the very first part of said story. And what it does is it absolutely sets all of the atmosphere for what you can expect within this movie. You can expect romance, adventure, mystery, magic, evil, even death is all going to happen, and then this is beautifully juxtaposed by our introduction to Aladdin. And just let's not forget that you have all of that fantastic comedy rendered to us by Robin Williams at the beginning of the movie. You already know what you're in for when you watch this movie. You might not know the story of Aladdin and the Magic Lamp, but you know that we are going to get horror, mystery, magic, romance, comedy, all these elements blended together to tell a story of a young man whose life was changed by this lamp, by this seemingly insignificant lamp. And why? Well, because he was more than what he seemed. He was a diamond in the rough. When the genie then throws up the sand and conjures up the night, he then says, Our tale begins with a dark night, where a dark man waits with a dark purpose. We are introduced to Jafar and Yago, who are just fantastic as a villainous duo. Yago, who is obviously the comedic one within the duo, and then Jafar, who is the truly murderous, conniving individual who allows for his henchmen to get absolutely wasted and obliterated by the Cave of Wonders. And in this, we are introduced again to actual death. We understand what the stakes are. People could die in this story if they are not careful around the villain being Jafar. And also that there are other elements within this world that are absolutely unforgiving. 
it is fantastic. It lets you know what the stakes are, who we are up against, and it's spooky. It's so good. And as I said, this is immediately juxtaposed by having Aladdin come on in. Everything is suddenly bright and beautiful, and you have this spunky young street rat who is going up against the guards, singing his heart out. Everything's fantastic. And then we see that he's not just some common thief. What really makes him the diamond in the rough is that when it would be so easy for him to take this loaf of bread that he's had to fight all of these guards for across the city of Agrabah, he shares his meal with two young orphans who are scrounging in the garbage for scraps. And this proves to us that he is indeed a better man, a flawed man, but a better man than what we than what we would have initially believed with him being a thief and a street rat. And so everything is set up. We're set up to realize that Aladdin is a good man and his journey is to become the man that he is supposed to be, to polish up that diamond and make it truly something of worth, that the villain is trying to overthrow the kingdom, become Sultan through some great powerful magic lamp. He must be stopped and the wishes of that lamp must be used for good. From that point onwards, we are swept off with the rest of the story. We are introduced to romance with Princess Jasmine. We are introduced to more magic and comedy through the genie. Everything is delivered on thing everything is delivered on that the powerful hook at the beginning gave to us. This is brilliant. We're given so much at the beginning. Everything is delivered throughout the movie. Everything you could think about, what did the what did we, what did we see at the beginning is given to us throughout the movie. It is so dang good. Now we know that Disney will never be able to replicate this. Why? Well, because Disney lacks boldness these days. When they did the live action adaptation, they were completely gutless with how they represented the opening. Yes, we've got the genie, we got Will Smith there, and he's singing in his little auto tune, but we don't get the mystery, the danger, the romance. We get the CGI. They go through the motions, they quote the movie, but there's no real humor in there. There's no real wonder. We don't get to see these sweeping dangerous vistas of Arabia. We don't get to see the juxtaposition of darkness, of evil, of power hungry madmen versus a thief who is introduced to us as just this happy go lucky plucky guy who is just kind of deserves to get his hands cut off but then we then see of the good man that he is deep down within after his long struggle against the guards we don't get any of that the live action definitely dumbed it down there's boldness in the original while the live action tried to go through all the motions the boldness wasn't there, the coloring wasn't there, the heart wasn't there. Also, keeping things on kind of a tight timeline, making sure that we're moving quickly to tell us everything that we need right off the bat before we get into the rest of the story proper. That's one of the problems with these live action adaptations. They feel like they can easily just tack on an extra hour and everything will be fine. One of the reasons why the cartoon originals do so well is because of the fantastic pacing. As we've talked about before, pacing is incredibly difficult. But for most stories, brevity, meaning being quick, saying only what you need to say, is usually the best route to go when telling most stories. Then we come to Pocahontas. Wow, what we get in this particular movie is we actually get two solid introductions. Now, this is actually a very dangerous thing to do. For instance, if we were to compare this for we were to compare this to the Stormlight Archive done by Brandon Sanderson, his very first book, The Way of Kings, has three different openings. You have the opening which tells us about the breaking of the honor pact of the of the great knights radiant and the beginning of their fall. We then get to see thousands of years down the road where Seth uh, Seth, son son Valano, the truthless of Shinovar, goes and murders the High King Gavilar for reasons that we don't really understand, but it's epic, it's cool, we are promised all of this amazing magic and action, it's going to be wow! And then we jump to, and we then jump to a character who gets killed in his introduction chapter, <laughs> which tells us who Kaladin is and about the war that is going to rip the kingdom apart. Three different openings, 
three different sets of promises. That's a lot to deliver on. Oh boy. So now when we have come to have a look at Bocahannes, what's happening with Bocahannes? We get two different introductions. These introductions, however, are important because they are actually blending together to tell one theme. So let's quickly have a look at the introduction for John Smith and the men of the Virginia Company. We have bustling London, this amazing metropolitan landscape, completely unlike North America at the time, where they do not have these massive buildings and sprawling cities. Oh no. No, oh, but these men right here who we know are colonizers who are going to bring death and destruction upon the Native Americans. We see them as actual people. We see them as loving fathers and sons and brothers who are going off to find fortune and fame, bring it back to their families and try to better their families. Other than Governor Ratcliffe and John Smith, everyone here is just basically normal hokey dokey Joe Schmo who's just trying to make their way in life and is taking a serious gamble with the Virginia Company. And we see these normal men struggling, banding together in the face of a hurricane to make their way on over to the new world and and just find the gold find that security find that comfort they believe it's going to be the dawning of a new age for them and sure they understand that there's going to be native americans to fight and they're ready to kill those indians in order to secure their fame and their fortune and that's just the world that they come from. Sure, we can disagree with them. We know what they're going to bring, historically speaking. But this introduction introduces us to them as people. As people just like you and me. You then have the introduction of Pocahontas' people. Where we get to see the Native Americans all together. We get to see their beautiful world. Which is untouched by the sprawling cities of Europe. But instead is a sprawling community that is living in harmony. Relative harmony with the land. And everything seems to be all great hunky-dory. However, this is something kind of interesting. We see all of these people coming back on canoes. Everyone is celebrating as they're singing this beautiful song about who they are and their identity to the land. And what do we then learn when the music is over? We have learned that this is a war band that just came back from annihilating their neighbors. These are, these are people are not from a perfect utopia, a peaceful utopia. These are warriors. But despite the fact that they are bloodied warriors, they too, just like the men of the Virginia Company, are men with families, families who love them, who are doing what they're doing because they want prosperity and security for their loved ones. And immediately in this introduction, we see the similarities between these two groups who we know are bound to clash and destroy each other. And these introductions are there to let us know these are just people. And unfortunately, people are going to misunderstand. They're not going to get along and they will fight over misunderstandings and resources. So this introduction sets up the conflict. It sets up the people and it makes us identify with these two groups. So that way, as the story progresses, we don't see them as villainous groups against each other. We know who the villain is. It's Governor Ratcliffe and that the main problem is the misunderstanding, the difference differences between these two communities and that's the adventure the journey that Bocahannes must go on to bridge the gaps between these two communities and show through love and understanding that you don't have to kill each other but that you can unite now then I already know why Disney will never will never ever make another opening like this number one because most writers at Disney do not know how to do two solid introductions. Again, it's a massive gamble. And most of these writers just take the path of least resistance, which says one just quick opening, and then we move on. We will not try to have two openings that kind of oppose each other, but tell us the same story to, to establish the important theme of the rest of the movie. Disney writers are just not that intelligent anymore. Big number two is this, Disney's never again going to handle the story of Pocahontas because that is a socially charged topic and how dare anyone ever suggest that the Europeans coming on over to America were anything else other than bloody, ferocious, greedy murderers. However, that, that particular stance 
kind of defeats the point of Pocahontas. Yes, we know that this is an absolutely ahistorical movie. There's so little of it that is based in anything real. In fact, the movie is based off of the propaganda that John Smith historically wrote to make himself seem like a really cool guy, which was mostly lies. So we understand that. That's not what's actually important. What's important is the theme, a timeless theme of understanding and love bridges gaps so that way we can avoid conflict and war amongst ourselves and between nations and other people because that's not okay we understand that that's not okay and it's something that's so easily avoidable but alas disney does not care about such wonderful messages anymore we then come to arguably the king of disney openings which is the lion king this beautiful opening tells us everything that we need to know about the story going on in. The story of nobility, of majesty, blending together the real world animals with some elements of magic at the very end. That there's something a little bit more going on here. And that this cub, Simba, is destined to be someone, something great. And we are told about the circle of life. This is the great journey for all everyone to go on and then we are introduced to scar right after the opening number and everything and we get to see how he is willing to destroy the bounds of nature he's willing to brush up against the, the proprieties of their society to overthrow the king he hates his nephew he is against everything that we got in that beautiful opening number and let me also just kind of point out right here that the animators were absolutely flexing with how they portrayed all of the animals in this opening which was very realistic and yet we get that little bit of magic there at the end with the sunbeam coming on in the animals all bowing showing a kind of reverence that naturally they wouldn't do in this powerful musical opening that just gets stuck in your head and puts a smile on your face we are again told the massive themes of the story you don't even need to know that this is basically a disnified version of hamlet you don't even need to know what hamlet is in order to understand the story of a young prince who is bound for great things and that he must be a part of this circle of life and the, the rest of the movie completely delivers on that hero's journey for Simba, for him to then become the king that he needs to be to restore the circle of life. The Lion King is easily Disney's best recognizable, best recognizable hero's journey story of maybe any of the stories that they have ever told. Now, the interesting thing is this, is that we have the live action adaptation of The Lion King. And so you would say, well, Lars, they obviously have done this introduction already. They replicated it. But did they really? Coming back to the magic of the scene, when you watch the live action adaptation, because they went for photorealism, the, the, the different animals don't have that magical quality that animation is able to give them. This is not so much a f storytelling failure on the part of, of the writers, but it is a failure of understanding what various adaptations can do for your story. So this, is a, this might seem a little bit complicated, but please quickly bear with me right here. 2D animation can do things that no other form of animation or live action are capable of doing. You can stretch the bounds of reality well beyond incredulity and tell amazing stories that defy all kind of reason and logic. And again, this is why I say that the animators were really flexing because they showed you something that felt so realistic, rendered in, in pencil and ink and paint. And then, they show us something magical, something that breaks what we understand of our own known world. By doing photorealistic 3D animation, it's so hard to capture that because you've lost that beautiful, fantastic quality that 2D animation is able to bring to their stories. And normally we suspend our disbelief more for 2D animation than we do for 3D and live action. 
As a result of Disney wanting to have their quote-unquote live-action adaptation, they threw away the literal magic of the scene and throughout most of the movie to have these photorealistic moments, which they do look good. It, it holds up fairly well, but as a lot of people point out, these animals just don't seem to have the, the expressions, the charisma, the movements that we expect for The Lion King, and as such, it just feels flat. And this is because Disney refuses to do 2D animation unless they absolutely, absolutely have to, and even then, they are lazy with it because they've gotten rid of so many of their best animators that all of the good 2D animators are now off doing stuff like Lackadaisy, making good cartoon cats. Now let's talk about Atlantis. This might seem like a bit of an interesting one to most people because Atlantis definitely isn't the best well-known or best well-received of all the Disney movies. In fact, it's a movie that lost Disney money. So as such, well, it, this is more of a cult classic, yet it is a perfect example of a fantastic opening. And again, an opening much like with Aladdin that comes in several acts. So you have the opening of Atlantis being destroyed, completely wiped out in a day and a night as we get from the quote uh, that we get from Plato's quote. Whoa, we get to see all of that destruction there on screen. We as the audience are immediately informed of this amazing, incredible lost empire that had such amazing technology and magic. It was thriving, it was huge, and then it was gone in an instant. It's a horrible story, and we're left with the mystery about why. Why did this happen? This then bleeds into our introduction to Milo, who seems like a very well-accredited young man historian who is telling people, we assume them to be real people until we realize, oh, they're all just mannequins and stuff slapped together to look like actual people, where he then t fills us in on what's happened since Atlantis was destroyed and the great search to rediscover Atlantis. And his theory about what could be found in the ruins of Atlantis, a great power source that could bring humanity to a new age. And then this ends with the very rude awakening of the museum directors rejecting Milo's proposal for a grant so he can go on an adventure to try to find the Shepherd's Journal, which will then help him to find Atlantis, and his dreams are crushed, and the rest of the story moves on. This two-act opening lets us know, again, about the stakes. Death is a very real thing throughout Atlantis. We are talking about the destruction of civilizations should anything go wrong, and that is fulfilled throughout the show, throughout the movie, I should say. And also, we are introduced to the comedy and the action that is Milo. We are given our main character through whom we get to see the rest of the story. We get to experience the thrill, the wonder, the discovery of everything that happens afterwards through his eyes. This is a very powerful, very good character introduction. Now, where the reason why Disney will never ever do this again is because Atlantis lost money and when Disney loses money on something unless it's Star Wars or Marvel they feel like they should never touch it again but if it's Star Wars or Marvel yeah sure we lost hundreds of millions of dollars let's do that again modern Disney makes absolutely no sense to me but another reason why Disney will never do this kind of opening again is because of the death involved. There's actually an alternate opening where Vikings using the Shepherd's Journal are trying to get to Atlantis, and you get this absolutely brutal sequence where we get to watch them all just get torn apart and killed. Wow. Well, Disney wants to be a family-friendly company. Not really. They like to just put on the facade of a family-friendly company. So they will never use this family-friendly facade of cartoon movies. Let's just say that Disney is weird. Disney is inconsistent. They, were, they are happy to embrace all kinds of violence and weird themes so long as it's not in cartoons because cartoons are just simply meant for children. And that is a fatal misunderstanding of what can be done with storytelling, especially animated storytelling. Disney gave up some of the best stories that they've made. And granted, yeah, 
the movies didn't necessarily make them a whole bunch of money. Movies such as Treasure Planet and Atlantis and The Emperor's New Groove, and yet those are movies that are so beloved all around by Disney fans. But for whatever reason, Disney just does not want to go back to them, in part because they don't like these kinds of violent stories, they feel like it's incongruent with animation, and then again, then again on top of that, if you were to give current day Disney writers the challenge to do a two-tiered, a two-act introduction, like with Bocahontas or with Aladdin or Atlantis, they would not be able to deliver on it because the basic understanding of writing just says one simple introduction, that's all you need, and then you move on with the rest of the story. Lastly, let's talk about The Hunchback of Notre Dame's phenomenal opening. The opening to this movie is absolute art, gritty, horrifying art. The Hunchback of Notre Dame throughout its entire runtime is a much, much darker movie and story than almost anything else that Disney has done aside from The Black Cauldron. And that easily comes across through the story that is told of the night that Frollo found gypsies sliding underneath the docks of Notre Dame and catching them finding it, believing that the woman amongst them had stolen goods and that Frollo proceeds to chase her down and murder her on the steps of Notre Dame and then plans on murdering her baby in the public well. Yeah, that's going to be really great for all of the bishops and priests who are over there at Notre Dame because there's, there's no way that they're going to not, that they're not going to get poisoned by having a dead body in the well. But through a combination of fantastic action, beautiful voice acting, gorgeous animation, just phenomenal music, we get the story of how the Archdeacon steps in, saves Quasimodo from being murdered, and charges Frollo's guilty conscience with, you will redeem yourself by taking care of that boy. And Frollo, of course, does not. We are introduced to the horrible man who will plague us throughout this entire movie and we see how everything is set up for him to just throw Quasimodo up into the bell tower, raise this monster who despite everything that Frollo is going to do to him is a good man. And why is it? Why is this the story that's being told to us? Well we are given that question at the very beginning of the movie. What makes a monster and what makes a man? And throughout the rest of the movie, we are going to see the qualities that humanize Quasimodo, even though he doesn't get the girl, even though so many things go wrong for him throughout the story, he is good, he is human, he is the best of the best. And Frollo, who has all of this power and is even given, despite his cruel deeds, a chance to repent and better himself, we get to see him at every single turn confirmed that he is a blasphemous sinner, that he is a monster up until the point that he has effectively just become a possessed demon running around with self-righteous, unholy anger all to satisfy his own lusts as all seven deadly sins course through him and destroy him. All of that is introduced in the opening. This is such a powerful opening. I personally would argue that it's even more powerful than the Lion King opening. The Lion King opening has such great music, it leaves you feeling so uplifted with a great big smile on your face, but the opening to The Hunchback of Notre Dame is poignant. You do not forget what you have experienced. You do not forget what you feel. And throughout the movie, you are vindicated in those feelings as you go through this religious, spiritual journey of these two characters, of hero and villain leading to the great climax at the end. And, and all of that, from the music to the tension and to the, to the, to the face-offs, all of that is introduced in the beginning. Now, why will Disney never again make an opening like this? 
for a variety of reasons. Number one, Disney, as we've talked about with Atlantis. Oh no, death, destruction, darkness, not in our great family cartoons. Then also, Hunchback of Notre Dame didn't make them all that much money, so there's no real reason for them to return to Hunchback of Notre Dame. Number three, it is impolite to call anyone a gypsy anymore, even though that was a historical term to refer to them as, but because that is inappropriate to use, and also now it's apparently becoming inappropriate to refer to them as Sinti and Ruma, which is actually their uh, historical names for their people. Yeah, Disney, of course, is not going to tread on all of these social landmines. On top of that, they're never going to put in a guy like Frollo into a movie again because that is the kind of villain that makes their wimpy writers wet their pants. It's so much better to write a pathetic, stupid loser of a villain who just has some mustache-twirling bad ideas but is honestly an incompetent dude rather than making a very powerful, almost in a creepy way justified, though we know he's honestly a villain and really none of what he's doing is right. Frollo is a character who in the name of justice is able to justify everything that he's doing. He is a leader of the people. He is keeping order within Paris and we get to see him slowly become the monster that he was hinted at to be at the beginning of the movie until he finally snaps and breaks during the wonderful musical number that is Hellfire. But no, Disney will never again deliver that kind of a villain to us because they are wimps. And just the, the, the passion, the skill, the technique in order to make such a gorgeous opening, such a poignant, powerful opening, is completely lost within the Disney company. Disney can no longer make these kinds of openings because they don't have the passion. They don't have the skill or the knowledge. They've gotten rid of so many of their great creatives and artists, and they don't want to do 2D animation anymore. Because of that, they've completely limited themselves. They're not even willing to engage in a very powerful medium, a medium that they could use to great effect. They don't need to make everything cartoons. They can make great CGI and live action movies and stories all they want, but leave Leaving out 2D animation is seriously cutting yourself at the knees, especially when that is the legacy of your company. So moving away from Disney, what can be told to us as authors, as novice authors, when we are tackling one of the most difficult challenges of any story, which is creating an engaging good opening? Well, when we look at the openings with, uh, across these different movies, they're all unique. They're all bold and engaging in their own way. What you need to understand for your story is, what is the story that I am telling? Who are my main characters? How do I want the audience to feel? What is the atmosphere of my story? Is it happy? Is it dark? Is it mysterious? Is it romantic? Is it comedic? And based off of that, that is what you craft your opening to be. Your opening must let your audience know about what the atmosphere of your story is, what are the main points of your story, and it should also introduce us to one of the main characters of our story. When the audience understands the main character, at least one of the main characters, when they understand the atmosphere of the story and they understand one of the elements, one of the main elements of your story, they then are like, okay then, I can now judge for myself as we're then either turning the page to the next chapter or as we're blending on over to the next scene, do I want to watch or read the rest of this story based off of what you've told me? And if the answer is yes, they are very likely going to see it through to the very end, which is why the opening needs to be as good as you can possibly make it. Now, this doesn't mean that you need to make your opening especially shocking or grandiose or too big or too convoluted, because then you might still lose some people and then you might not be able to deliver on all the promises that you've made in your opening. Again, you need to understand what it is that you want to tell with your story. Me personally, I like having some action-filled openings. I like to make sure that one main character is well highlighted and I like to really infuse some of the atmosphere that I hope to have throughout the entire book into that first uh, first chapter. And whether I'm going to highlight the mystery or the drama or the comedy or the action and I might have all of those things throughout the book but I want to make sure that there's one specific element that I'm letting the audience know you're going to get this throughout the story and you're going to get it in spades. If this is what you like you're going to love the rest of what you read. So again to sum up 
you as the author, when you're working on crafting your opening, just remember this, it can be anything that you want it or need it to be. You can have multi-tiered openings, you can have several introductions, you can have two or three prologues if you wish and be really bold, but whatever it is that you are doing with your opening, you need to make sure that you are introducing one of the main themes of your story, you need to make sure that you're introducing at least one of your main characters, and that you are firmly establishing the atmosphere, the feel that you hope to have permeate the entirety of your story. If you can do that in your opening, you have made a good opening. Making it engaging and really stick the landing, that comes down to editing, that comes down to peer review, that comes down to building up your skill as an author, which you can do. I have firm faith that you can make that happen, as opposed to what Disney's been showing to us. They've proven that they can't make that happen. So don't be like Disney, be a good writer, be bold, know what you want to do with your opening, make sure that you nail the things that you need to have, have your main theme, one of your main characters, and your atmosphere. If you can do that, you, my friends, have done a solid opening. So I hope that you've enjoyed this dive through some of Disney's greatest hits and why they will unfortunately never do them again, because Disney sucks right now. And honestly, I don't even see them ever returning to this, even with new management or with new creatives. Disney as a company has just kind of moved on, has forgotten its glorious past. And I just really don't ever see them moving back to it. Maybe they'll have their own renaissance 10, 20 years from now, but it's definitely not happening in the next couple of years, Ugh, sadly enough. But that doesn't mean that you can't be entertained by fantastic stories. We ourselves have published some stories that we're very proud of, and you can find the links for them in the description below. I guarantee that you will find one book in our library that you will especially enjoy. But anyway, thank you so much for joining us on this incredible adventure that we call writing. Even if you don't check out one of our books, we're still happy that you spent time here with us. And if you will like, comment, share, subscribe, all of that's really helpful. But otherwise, thank you so much for joining us on this incredible adventure that we call writing. And until the next video, y'all, tschüss.